Uh, also at our clinic in the University of Pittsburgh, we are a treatment and management center for people with HD. So where there are now new medications and new approaches uh, to the management and treatment of HD, so the person who comes in, their dad's experience with Huntington's disease isn't necessarily going to be their experience with HD because we have many more medications to offer. And I would say in my 30-year career in working with HD families, the biggest difference that we have now is really centering around quality of life. It used to be that people with HD spent the last 10 or 20 years of their life in a nursing home. Now that may be the last year of their life, but they'll be at home otherwise and they'll be part of that family unit. So I think that the quality of life has increased dramatically. No, we don't have a cure yet. No, we don't have an effective treatment for Huntington's disease, but we've really made great strides in the process. People with Huntington's disease need a lot of calories they need 5,000 to 8,000 calories a day. Um, and in nursing homes, this is something that the staff doesn't realize because they deal mostly with older people who don't need many calories. And people with Huntington's disease do better if they get enough to eat. One of the symptoms of Huntington's disease that was especially bothering him was he was choking a lot when he ate. I remember my sister told me, my, my youngest sister went to check on him and they, the siblings were taking turns checking on him. And she brought him some food, and he was really hungry. So he ate immediately, and he ate very quickly, and he choked while she was there. And she went into a panic and tried to help him, but he had developed this way of giving himself the Heimlich maneuver. And so he just immediately rushed into his bathroom threw himself over the ledge of the bathtub and gave himself the Heimlich maneuver. And apparently he had been doing that on a frequent basis. We got to a point where we decided as a family that it was much too dangerous for him to be living alone in this mobile home. So we got some, um, some agencies involved that agreed to help us and they went to his home and told him that he was no, not able to live there any longer. They wanted to take him out of the home, have him checked out, and to get him some help. So that's what happened. He went into a hospital for a few days. They ran some tests and checked him over, and then um, were able to place him into nursing care. He was in the nursing home for three weeks, and I think it, it would have been something that he would have liked, you know, had he been given enough time there because there were people around. And he didn't, as much as he said he wanted to live alone, I think that was because he wanted to, not, to deny that there was anything wrong with him. But I think he really liked having people around. And let's face it, they were making three meals for him a day. You know, they were cooking for him and there was food available and there were people to talk to and check on him all the time. Unfortunately, Somebody had brought him a lunch. He was supposed to be on a soft diet. Somebody brought him a regular lunch and then left it in his room with him, and he choked. They found him a little bit later in his bathroom over the ledge of the shower. There was only a shower in his room. There was no bathtub. So he had run into the bathroom to give himself the Heimlich maneuver, and he couldn't do it. And he didn't have time to then make plan B, which was to go out and find somebody to help him. So he, he died after three weeks in the nursing home. That was a hard thing for us, knowing that we had made that choice for him to move him and put him there. So we had to come to grips with that. Usually the Huntington's disease people are causing a little bit of trouble. They might... Uh, um, just want something real quick and of course the nursing staff doesn't have the, the number of people to just get them what they want real quick but they also like Peggy said treat them like they have Alzheimer's or treat them like they have dementia or something and the people with Huntington's disease they're they're always there they might take a long time to get the answer out but when you ask them a question you, you want something right away when we're talking back and forth 
we, we're just thinking what, what you're going to say, what I'm going to say next, and they might take 30 seconds, they might take a whole minute or something, and the staff is just ready to leave the room. So um, sometimes they're having some trouble like that. Sometimes our, our people might be acting out a little bit, so they ask us to come. And we do a whole in-service day, and sometimes we'll have two or three or four people there. Sometimes we'll have family people there. Uh, sometimes we'll have a hundred people there. And it's just um, some of the, the in-services are mandatory, so then a lot of people will come. But on, on the usual uh, day, we have people that are really interested and really wanting to get to know the Huntington's people. And uh, once they get to know the person, then they're able to treat them better, and they do get along better. And if one pill's good, two has to be better. And they gave him medication for Alzheimer's, and he was, he was taking just whatever they gave him, that's what he was taking. And you'd ask the neurologist, is there anything that he come off of? Well, nobody ever wanted to take that step and say, that's try taking him off of, and they just came off one at a time. It came off a week, we watched him a week, and then uh, we, we could do the next one. But it was, it was definitely a trial and error, like everything else. You know, I worked all my life. Nobody gave me anything. So many times, too, they have a lot of movement, and some of the staff thinks they're hitting them. We have to talk to them about that, too. That it's a big movement like this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a strong, big movement. Like one husband said, I don't know whether she was hitting me or if it was the Huntington's disease. But it's a big movement and staff becomes afraid of the people. Yeah. We've had people uh, at one of the hospitals that got in trouble and they had to be put on a different floor because they were hitting. Well, they really weren't hitting. It was just their movements. We had another patient that got into trouble too, but they came in very early in the morning. The person was sleeping, came in and took his blood, scared him half to death, and of course he hit the, the person that was getting the blood. Yeah, you know, because so the he, person never said to the person, mm -hmm. the per, this person was asleep, yeah. and the person just, the nurse walked in and started taking his blood. Mm -hmm. Now what would you do if somebody tried to take your blood, shoot something in your arm mm -hmm. when you're half asleep and not explain it? So this person was treating the person with Huntington's disease as a thing, as a person who is completely out of it. He was released from the state hospital, but um, he couldn't live independently in the community. So they found him a placement in a rest home up in Massachusetts. And I had told him at that time that I still couldn't have him come and live with me and the kids, that I felt it was too dangerous mm -hmm. or too risky. Right. And um, we helped him find the rest home up in Massachusetts. And that was kind of his training ground again, or his proving ground again, to prove that without mm -hmm. the structure of the state hospital, with mm -hmm. being independent, with taking his medications, with being out in the community, not having mm -hmm. any, any aggressions, mm -hmm. that he was able to, to control his behavior again. So it took right. about eight months of that setting mm -hmm. before I felt comfortable with bringing him down with us. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, I, I never stopped loving him and never stopped wanting to help him through this condition. Mm -hmm. um, but I just had to think of myself and the kids first as well. But then I moved in in 2009, in August. 10. 2010? Yeah. Okay. So in August of 2010, Russ came down to live in Pittsburgh with us mm -hmm. and has been uh, successfully with us ever since. Right. He was old insane asylum. Yeah. It is. I know. He was, he was committed to the, to the mental hospital. <laughs> I, I had to think of it. I don't know what the correct DC word is. <laughs> we can't put insane asylum in a in a video. <laughs>